Well, now to a crisis of water impacting countries around the globe. In the United States, at least seven states are affected by the alarming depletion of the Colorado River. With the water levels of Lake Powell and Lake Mead reaching historic lows, some are calling it an absolute nightmare. Author and journalist Erica Geis is sounding the alarm in her book, Water Always Wins. She joins Hari Srinivasan to discuss innovative ways to conserve the precious resource. This conversation is part of the ongoing public media initiative, Peril and Promise, on the challenges and solutions of climate change. Thanks, Erica. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, your book talks about water in kind of a global sense, but here in the United States right now, there's a very active conversation on what's happening to the Colorado River and how essentially all the states that benefit from the water of that river are trying to figure out how to redo and rethink an agreement. Um, why is this so crucial to the United States? Water is an inherently local issue. Every place has its own unique geology, ecology, and human culture. And so, you know, all the solutions need to be tailored within, within those realms. And um, a, a point that I make in my book is that, yes, climate change is making drought and uh, flooding much more intense. But a significant part of our issues with water are related to our development choices. So that's urban sprawl, industrial agriculture, and even the concrete uh, kind of very control-oriented way that we try to manage water mm -hmm. has dramatically altered the water cycle. And in that way, um, we've created a lot of problems for ourselves. When we look at how we engineer how water gets to us, people will say, yes, obviously there are more demands on the water. There's greater population than there was 100 years ago when these uh, treaties were signed. But haven't we kind of engineered our way into a solution where there are unintended consequences that we, that we didn't think about by putting in these sorts of canals and dams that we have? I think the very heavily engineered water system that we have has worked to a point, but now we're hitting these tipping points with population growth and climate change. Um, but I just want to offer a couple of statistics to give some perspective on how we've interfered with the water cycle. So mm -hmm. humans have drained or filled 87% of the world's wetlands, and we've intervened with dams and diversions on two-thirds of the world's large rivers. And the land area covered by our cities has doubled just since 1992. So in all of these ways, we're actually preventing water from uh, it, having its slow cycles. So these are wetlands, floodplains, mountain meadows, and forests where water can slow on the land and move underground. And the relationship between surface and groundwater is really important. And I think it's something that people have really forgotten in the US West. Uh, you know, We tend to think of groundwater as extra water when surface water runs dry. But in fact, the surface water and groundwater are connected. And when you have a healthy water table um, that supplies uh, streams, rivers, and wetlands from below, if you could explain this idea of slow water. So all the people around the world uh, who I met, uh, these are um, engineers, ecologists, landscape architects, urban planners who are doing these really innovative things with water. Um, they are all seeking to restore slow phases that we've eradicated with development. And they're also seeking to like reconnect that surface groundwater link. Um, and so I came to think of them as uh, part of the slow water movement, which I find analogous to the slow food movement. I mean, that's that's why I thought of it, because slow yeah. food movement is, uh, you know, drawing attention to where our food comes from and how its growth uh, impacts local people and the environment. And similarly, um, the way that we relate to water is having these kinds of impacts. So there are some characteristics of slow water. Um, it, they are distributed across the landscape rather than centralized. Uh, they are socially just. They don't take water from one place and give it to another. They don't um, protect one area that, and then therefore make another area more vulnerable. Uh, there's often a community engagement component. Um, so places I traveled in India and Peru, for example, um, Kenya, you had local people who were 
actually, um, you know, building and maintaining these projects, sometimes collaborating with each other uh, in a very hands-on way. It's kind of hard to imagine that in the United States, although certainly people who are landowners have done things like this on their own property. Um, but there can also be an educational component, like if you reclaim that industrial site alongside the river and uh, build a park there, you can have signage that explains to the public, um, you know, what's happening with the water cycle there. Um, and to a large extent, slow water is local. And, you know, that can seem anathema to places like the, the U.S. West and California, where we bring so much water from elsewhere. Yeah. Um, but it's really means you know, making the most of the water that comes and, you know, capturing it on site, having it be there locally and trying to think in terms of, of living within your water means. You also mentioned, for example, the, the ripple effects of what we've done as human beings on all the different river sheds and the river uh, systems around the world by, for example, putting dams. On the one hand, uh, lots of people who engineer this and countries will say, Hydroelectric power is is fantastic. It's so much better than you know us trying to use fossil fuels. It's here for us. Um, but at the same time, we are now in a situation where Lake Mead um, is running potentially so low that it might not be able to generate power in the future. Yeah, I think there are some misconceptions about hydropower. Before I wrote a lot about uh, water, I wrote a lot about renewable energy. And, um, you know, there are countries in Southern Africa, like Zambia, for example, uh, Mozambique, where they get 96% of their power from hydropower. And, you know, for a long time, people thought of hydropower as reliable base load power. But, you know, we've seen really terrible droughts um, where hydropower isn't able to be produced anymore. And then you have... Um, you know, entire economies collapsing at times if, if you have a country where, um, you know, you're entirely dependent on that hydropower. Um, and even countries that aren't 100% or, you know, largely dependent on the hydropower um, can still have significant impacts. I'll also add that um, for a long time, hydropower was considered to be a carbon-free source of electricity. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it's not. There's been um, an increasing body of science showing the emissions that are embedded within hydropower that were not really counted because people just presumed oh we're not burning anything so it's fine um, but you know there's a, a lot of um, emissions embedded in concrete um, I think something like eight percent of our global emissions come from concrete uh, and then there's uh, significant methane releases uh, from the reservoir as that uh, plant material decomposes um, so you know it can take uh, you know more than a decade um, of like the equivalent of burning fossil fuels to to uh, overcome that embedded carbon within a dam. Um, and then there's just really, really major um, ecological and sociological impacts, which have been pretty well documented around the world. China, for example, has very visibly gone through uh, some of that hardship of people being displaced because of the needs of a dam. You also write about something that's kind of interesting. I haven't heard about it before, this sponge cities that they have there. What are those and what can we learn from them? I mentioned that the area covered by pavement in our cities globally has doubled just since 1992. And we've seen a real increase in urban flooding. And it's because when rain falls, um, I mean, partly it's because climate change is bringing bigger storms, but part of it is also because that water can't sink into the soil. And so it just runs off the pavement and then you have a lot of water at once that you have to do something with. And there's a landscape architect there named Yu Kongxiong, um, who is uh, pretty well known internationally uh, for his work in trying to find places within the city for water to slow and move underground. And he does this through his landscape projects. So the president of China, Xi Jinping, uh, became aware of this work and decided to make it a nationwide program to try to make cities uh, more permeable and dubbed it sponge cities. And I really like that, um, that moniker because 
it's very evocative. You know, you mentioned that the soil absorbing the, the water and then releasing it later uh, when it's needed. And so within a city, there are various ways to do this. Um, you know, you can have green roofs, um, you can have bioswales, which are like um, ditches that absorb stormwater and typically they're lined with uh, native plants that can tolerate both the water and the dry period. Um, you can do infiltration wells, which are kind of uh, conical wells into the ground and then the water absorbs through the sides. Uh, you can make your pavement permeable. Uh, you can make uh, incentives to increase infiltration, like with street trees and things like that. You mentioned that, you know, trying to return water back more towards the natural state of how it flowed doesn't just have a regional benefit, but it can help with this existential crisis that we face about climate change. How? You know, there's an expression that climate change is water change, and that's because um, a lot of the ways that we are starting to experience climate change in our own communities is through these water extremes, um, you know, heavy flooding or really intense droughts. And I think, um, you know, people can feel really overwhelmed by climate change. Um, we're waiting for our national leaders to make deals with other national leaders and everybody to reduce their emissions. And, you know, that's incredibly important. Um, but 25% of our emissions come from land use change. And these slow water solutions have a really important carbon storage component. Um, and in some cases, like different kinds of wetlands can store three to five times more carbon dioxide than forests. You know, just recently we had John Hickenlooper on the program, and he was talking about the need for senators to come together and, and try to hash out their uh, disagreements about how to use the water on the Colorado. If you were in that room, so to speak, <laughs> where these people are, I mean, what is, based on your reporting and the water detectives that you've talked to and the research that you've done for this on what's working around the world, how, um, what does the water, what does the Colorado want and how can we help it become more, I guess, life-sustaining, which is beneficial to us? What water wants uh, is a return of these slow phases that we've eradicated with our development, um, you know, the wetlands, the floodplains. So there are a lot of different things that we can do. Um, you know, beaver restoration is a really important thing that's happening in the Western U.S. It started kind of in Washington State, but now it's expanding to Oregon and California and Colorado. And, um, you know, Trappers came first across the United States and Canada and eliminated most of the beavers, uh, killed them through trapping uh, for the fur trade. And so when settlers came, the landscape was already significantly dried out from what it had been naturally. And beavers play a really important role. You know, they build these ponds and that slows water. And then, um, you know, the water can then move underground and join the, the surface water at a later date floodplains. So, you know, when we put levees right along the floodplain and use that land for development or for farming, um, we are raising the level of the river and increasing flood risk. Uh, but we are also preventing that water from slowing on the floodplain. And that uh, kind of whisks our water away and makes less of it available into the dry season. There's a lot of important processes for carbon storage and food and salmon that happen on the floodplain. So in some places, including California, there are new policies to encourage moving the levees back to the far edge of the floodplain and returning that land to water. But I really do think um, it requires thinking more in terms of you know, I, I hesitate to say this because I feel like it sounds a little like new agey, but the abundance mentality versus the scarcity mentality, mm. um, you know, when you are not trying to suck out every drop and maximize every efficiency, you're leaving more water in the system for it to do its thing. And, you know, like in California, we have this, um, uh, you know, fish versus farmers argument. But um, there's been some good scientific work showing that when you set back the levee on the floodplain, 
and you allow the fish to spend time on the floodplain when they're small, um, they get really, really big, um, you know, significant five, 10 times fatter than they would if they're just going through the river because the river in a levee is like a food desert. Yeah. Um, so the fish on the floodplain gets fat and happy, is much stronger, doesn't need as much special attention. And then that water is that same water that was benefiting the fish is moving back into the river over a longer period of time and keeping water levels higher during the summer. So the same water is benefiting the fish and the farmers. And um, so that's just one example of the way in which um, providing for the systems and making them healthier, uh, you know, they can better provide for us. Erica, guys, thanks so much for joining us. The book is called Water Always Wins, Thriving in an Age of Drought and Deluge. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.